eggs, a classic. First, I'm gonna start with an egg. I've cooked this egg to, uh, well, it's gonna be a little bit runny inside. So I'm gonna start by rolling my egg in a little bit of flour. Now, I've used pork that I've infused with, a little bit of sauteed shallots, I deglazed with a little bit of whiskey, I threw in some fresh thyme, a little bit of sage. Um, you can use any kind of pork and season any way you so choose, and that's what makes this so versatile and fun. So I'm gonna take this, I wanna make sure that it's about the same consistency all the way around, because it has to be the same thickness, because it'll cook at the same time. So, there we go. We have our egg that's been dipped in flour. I'm gonna wrap it around. You make sure that you seal all of this egg in. Got a nice egg breaded in our pork mixture. Mm. Next, I'm gonna put it in a little bit of flour. The flour is gonna help the egg adhere to this and then I'm gonna bread it with breadcrumbs. Now, I'm gonna put this in here. I'm gonna start breading it. I'm going to use my spoon to pull and push delicately so that this gets complete egg wash. Gonna mix this around, top it with a little bit of breadcrumbs, roll it. Now, this is ready to go as is. It could go right into the fryer. Drop it in nice and carefully. I wanna make sure that it doesn't stick to the bottom and that it rolls around a little bit. Um, so this is actually gonna go for five to seven minutes. Mmm, scotch egg. Mm-hmm. Well done. Preserved lemons, typically found in North African and Moroccan dishes. But there's no reason why you can't incorporate this at home. This is something you could add to roast chicken, steamed rice, sky's the limit. So be inspired and be creative. To start, I'm gonna take a lemon that I've thoroughly washed and scrubbed. Uh, this is important because it's gonna be fermenting, so we need to get rid of any impurities that might be on the skin. I'm then gonna cut each end of my lemon off. Next, I will quarter the lemon almost. I'm gonna leave about an inch of room down at the base of the lemon. I'm gonna start by taking salt. You can use kosher salt or sea salt. Uh, just use a nice quality salt. So I'm gonna put about a tablespoon or two inside the lemon. I'm now going to put it into my jar and I'm actually going to squeeze it down. Now this is incredibly important. You need your jar to be very, very full. I've got a muddler stick here. You could use a large spoon or even your hand if you could fit it. And I'm actually going to just push it down. And as I push it down, you'll see a bit of the juices popping out. I've also got some aromatics here. Sky's the limit. You can use cloves or cinnamon. I'm gonna use bay leaf and peppercorn. Place these in the jar anywhere you like. They will move around. A Little bit of peppercorn on top and on the sides. I'm then going to top this off with lemon juice that I've squeezed. You're gonna end up using about one lemon juiced per lemon in the jar. Top with a little bit of salt to complete this fermenting process and put on a lid. You're gonna leave this on your countertop for six to 10 days and you're gonna flip it every now and then, every other day or so. You might find that you need to top it up with a little more lemon juice after a couple days. After three to four weeks of your lemons fermenting in the fridge, you can take them out, give them a rinse, cut out the inside, believe it or not, you actually only use the outside, cut into thin strips or small dices and add it to any chicken or rice dish. There's nothing quite like a homemade marshmallow. I honestly don't think you can buy them anywhere nearly as good as you can make them at home. I started by heating two cups of sugar, a quarter cup of water, and two thirds of a cup of corn syrup to a boil until my sugar dissolved. In the meantime, I had some gelatin blooming in about a half a cup of water with three packages of gelatin. I let that sit about eight to 10 minutes until my gelatin had fully bloomed. I then incorporated by pouring my sugar into my gelatin mixture while my mixture was moving at a high speed. I've got my mixture on the stove on a medium high heat. I'm gonna stir it occasionally. And what I'm looking for is all the grains in the sugar to break down and become a clear liquid. Okay, at this point we have to work quite quick. Don't fuss too much about getting most of your mixture out. Get what you can out and get it into the container. Once my marshmallow mixture has leavened for about eight to 10 minutes, I wanna get it out of the mixing bowl as soon as I can. 
into a pre-greased pan. In my pan, I've got a little bit of parchment paper, which I've oiled underneath so the parchment paper will stick as well. I've oiled on the top. Remember, lightly oil this, not over oil. I then get my marshmallow mixture into the pan, let it settle, smear it around if I need to, and then I'm gonna top it with a little bit of icing sugar. Then, take your saran wrap, place it on top, and in three to four hours, it'll be ready to work with. After my marshmallows have set up for about three to four hours, I can peel them out of the container carefully. Depending on the flavor you want to use, for this block here, I've decided to use icing sugar. I'm going to actually roll the block in the icing sugar mixture, and that's gonna make it easier for me to work with. I'm then going to take a knife, lightly oil it. It's gonna allow me to cut through the marshmallows a little bit easier. I'll start by cutting the size I want, at this point, it can be very sticky, but have some fun with it. Now, with these other ones, I've rolled some in toasted coconut. I've also rolled some in a little bit of icing sugar, cocoa, and cinnamon mixture. Sky's the limit. Have some fun. Maple butter, an extra special addition to any Sunday brunch. Starts out with maple syrup. What we do is we bring it up, we let it boil. We're then going to cool it and slow it activating all of the sugar crystals in it to create a nice light butter. This is a good addition on toast as well as waffles. It's freezer friendly and it can stay in the fridge for at least up to a month. I recommend making some of this at home. My maple syrup is in a high pot. Uh, there was a little bit of syrup to begin with. I put it in here because as you can see, it actually leavens quite a bit and bubbles. At this point, the sugar is quite hot and it isn't, it isn't safe to touch. So you'd want to be really mindful when handling this. I'm going to pour it into a bowl that I've got in another bowl with a little bit of ice. And this is going to help me cool down the mixture slowly to get the crystals and the sugar to caramelize. Lightening up, I'm incorporating air, I'm activating the sugar crystals in it. Nobody can resist this. Maple butter, today I've got it on toast, but you can put it on waffles, pancakes, or anything you can spread it on. Gnocchi, one of my favorite comfort foods. With three simple ingredients, the outcome is a light, fluffy potato dumpling. And who doesn't love dumplings? I'm using a russet potato. For this recipe, you would use about a pound of potato, one egg, and 100 grams of flour. Uh, so here I am, just scooping out this potato. I'm gonna try to save the inside a little bit, and I can utilize the skins later to fill with whatever I so choose. Now, if you don't have a ricer, you can always push your baked potatoes through a mesh strainer. I recommend doing this while it's warm if it's gonna be a little easier to work with. So I'm adding my flour. I'm also going to add some salt. And in goes my egg. And there's the start of my gnocchi. I'm going to do it with a spoon to save my hands, a little bit of cleanup, uh, but you're welcome to do this on the counter. So you want to lightly incorporate all of these ingredients into your dough. Uh, you don't want to overmix this. The beautiful thing about a gnocchi is its light, fluffy texture, and that's achieved by not overmixing and strengthening the gluten in the flour. So at this point, I've got a base dough. It can be a little mealy. I don't have to worry about that. I want to lightly knead my dough, not too much. If you need to, add a little bit of flour. But remember, you want this to maintain a little bit sticky to the touch. I've cut my dough ball into quarters. So I'm gonna start by rolling with my hands, and as I roll, I'm pushing out the dough with my fingers. Now remember, a little sticking is okay. You want it to be a little sticky. What I do like to do is have a little bit of flour on my cutting board that I dip in my pastry cutter. This allows it to not stick, or helps it to not stick. So when I cut, I cut and I push it away. Cut, push it away. 
I've got some boiling water here. I'm gonna add to that a little bit of salt. This is my opportunity to season the gnocchi when it absorbs the water. I'm also going to add my gnocchi to the water. I don't wanna overcrowd the pan because it'll all stick together. The nice thing about gnocchi is it tells you when it's done by coming to the surface. I like to take it from after it's been boiled and put it into a pan uh, with a little bit of butter, crisp it up, brown it up, and add whatever flavorings I want to. Today I'm using sage. I've got my brown butter and sage gnocchi here. I'm gonna finish with a little bit of pecorino, and that's all it needs. A simple white wine sauce. You can use this for any seared meat. What I've done here is I've taken some chicken breasts, I've pan seared them, and I've finished them in the oven. I've just pulled my pan out of the oven, and I've added a little bit of garlic, thyme, rosemary, and bay leaf, as well a little bit of butter. This is gonna help me add some additional flavor to my chicken and get the base of my sauce going. These are my leftover bits that have stuck to the bottom of the pan. This is called a fond. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put in shallots. We're gonna start cooking. It's gonna help deglaze the pan. I'm then gonna add a little bit of wine. I'm gonna reduce it about by half to cook off the alcohol. And I'm gonna finish with a little bit of cream. I've reduced my wine by half. I'm gonna add a little bit of chicken stock, a touch of cream, and I'm gonna finish the sauce with butter. This is gonna add a lot of body and sheen to the sauce. My sauce is reduced to a consistency that I'm happy with. I can pour this over chicken or my mashed potatoes. Enjoy. Yorkshire puddings, one of my absolute favorites. Some of my favorite textures, crunchy and chewy, all in one. Traditionally used to sop up gravy with roast dinners, but I could eat them on their own any time of day. For my Yorkshire puddings, I'm gonna need four eggs, 300 milliliters of milk, 225 grams of flour, can be all purpose or cake or pastry, and a teaspoon of salt. I'm gonna whisk my eggs until there's a little bit of air incorporated. I'm gonna add half of my milk and then my sifted flour. Uh, this is gonna help me reduce any lumps I'm gonna have. After I have a nice, consistent, smooth mixture, I'm gonna add the rest of my milk, finish with salt, and let my batter rest one hour up to a whole day. You want to use an oil with a high smoke point. So that would be a canola oil, a grapeseed oil, uh, and in today's recipe, I'm gonna use a sunflower seed oil. I'm going to pour into each container all the way up to the top. I'm gonna to tip it down, and what's gonna happen is each vessel is gonna fill with oil. You wanna make sure that your oil in your pan is as hot as possible. This is a trick to a really, really great, tall Yorkshire pudding. Uh, you need to make sure you pull it out of the oven at its hottest, hottest point. You wanna leave it in for about 10 to 15 minutes or until it's smoking. You wanna pull your tray out of the oven and you wanna pour in your batter as quick as possible and get it back in the oven. The oven's set at 425 and they're gonna bake for 20 to 25 minutes. My idea of a perfect Yorkshire pudding is achieving the small cavity inside, and this is what's going to hold all your gravy. It's crunchy, it's chewy, and it can be filled with gravy. Mmm. A guilt-free, nutritious snack, cheesy kale chips. I love bringing these to a party. They get their cheesiness and the nutty flavor from nutritional yeast and cashews. To my blender, I'm gonna add one cup of cashews, a cup of red bell pepper, a third cup of nutritional yeast, two teaspoons of onion powder, one teaspoon of garlic powder, a teaspoon and a half of salt, and a quarter teaspoon of cayenne pepper. I'm then gonna add four ounces of olive oil and a little bit of water to get the right consistency. I've got some washed curly kale here with ribs and stems removed. I'm gonna pour my cheese sauce on it and massage it into each piece so that they are consistently covered in my sauce. I'm then gonna put it in the oven at 275 for about 20, 25 minutes and I'm gonna flip each piece and put it back again for 20 to 25 minutes uh, or until crispy. You won't believe how creamy, cheesy, hearty and healthy these kale chips are. Personally, I can't get enough of them. Mm. 
I truly love an oyster on the grill. It's a great introduction to some friends who haven't had them, as well as it's a quick go-to, relatively simple to prepare, and uh, it comes in its own little vessel where you get to uh, use it as a spoon. To shuck an oyster, one, oyster knife. Two, you're gonna need to find the hinge on the oyster. It's pretty easy. There's a rounded end and a hinge end. You actually wanna physically look and find it because that's where your knife is gonna go. I also need a towel that's gonna keep my hand protected as well as help me secure the oyster. So I'm gonna start by getting a firm grip with my oyster, take my knife into the hinge end, and I really wanna protect my hand here. Pushing on a downward motion, I wanna find the inside of the oyster and now you can almost feel it pop. This is gonna be a little bit of work, but it's well worth the effort. Nailed it. So, now that I've popped my oyster nicely and delicately, if you chip some skin away, that's okay, just be careful. I'm going to run my knife along the side of the oyster. It's gonna help me sort of pry it open a little bit. Now, it's gonna be hard to get into. There's a muscle that attaches to the top and a muscle that attaches to the bottom. So what I wanna do is I wanna take my oyster knife and actually run it on an angle along the top of the oyster and that's going to help me release the shell. You also want to be very careful that you don't damage the oyster meat. So I've gotten into my oyster. I want to be very careful at this point because you want to save these juices. I'm going to run my life along the bottom end of it as well and then I'm going to put it on a surface where none of that juice can escape. I've got my oysters shucked. I'm going to head out to the grill. I love grilling them because it's just a different variation on the raw oyster as well as it's a little more friendly for your guests uh, if they're not so sure about them. This is excellent at your party. It's a real crowd pleaser. One of my favorites. I absolutely love this for grilling and entertaining. It's a really good go-to for a quick bite to eat. It's also really nice for your vegetarian friends. I've tossed it in a little bit of olive oil, or you could use canola oil or butter, uh, and a little bit of Cajun seasoning. So now's a good time to pull out some of those old spices you haven't seen in a while. Season up your okra, get it onto a very hot grill, put a light char on the outside of the okra, and then it's just about ready. These have been cooking for about five to seven minutes on a high heat grill. I'm looking for a nice green color and a little bit of char marks, and you want them to be slightly soft, but maintain some of their crunch. Your friends are going to love these. Get them out on the table, dip them into, well, they're pretty versatile, so any dip will do, and a ranch or a honey mustard, and uh, your friends are gonna really enjoy these. Grilled sangria. Your party guests are absolutely going to love this. The beauty of this is that you can make it in advance and get your wine mulling with all of the different flavors and then you can finish it when your guests arrive. To start, I've got some dry red wine here that I've thrown in a couple of cinnamon sticks a few hours ago just kind of to incorporate a little bit of a different flavor. I've then got my charred fruit that I did on the barbecue and we do this because we want to add a little bit of caramelization as well as a little bit of a grill flavor to it. It's going to completely change the flavor profile of this drink. In goes my charred orange juice that I've just squeezed. I'm then going to add a little bit of trickle, triple sec or any orange liqueur. Um, as you know, sangria is something that's really versatile so you can change it however you like. In goes about a quarter cup of triple sec and at this point I can either put it in the fridge and save it until my guests arrive or I can finish it with uh, I'm going to use ginger ale. You could also use club soda or a lime soda. Uh, this adds a nice sweetness as well as carbonation to the drink. 
With the grilled fruit and the caramelization that happens, as well as the addition of the dry red wine, touch of cinnamon, and a little bit of orange liqueur, and to top it off, a little bit of ginger ale, you're gonna have the most amazing backyard sangria grilled. cheese, an excellent addition to any grill. What makes this cheese really unique and special is that it's a semi-soft, unripened cheese that's pressed. So what that means is you can put it on the grill, achieve those really excellent grill marks and that nice dark color, and it'll hold its shape, which makes it excellent for putting on skewers or just leaving out on the table for your friends to uh, take a bite of here and there. I'm actually going to grill this on a really high heat. I'm going to get those nice marks, because that's what we're looking for, and I'm going to take it off, finish it with a little bit of olive oil, lemon juice, and some fresh oregano. Halloum cheese is an excellent alternative to other sort of items on the grill and it's going to be an excellent conversation piece for you and your friends to talk about as well as eat. Grilling bacon. Absolutely love grilling bacon. It gets you out of the kitchen and into the backyard where the barbecue is. Also saves you a pan to clean up. When I start, I like to find a really thick cut, naturally smoked bacon. Uh, I put it on a medium heat, and while I'm cooking it, I watch for flare-ups. You wanna make sure that the little bits of uh, grease that drip down don't flare up and start a bit of a fire, so don't leave it unattended. I like to cook this into, uh, until I like it. I like it almost on a crispy side. I finish it with a little bit of black pepper, and then I glaze it with maple syrup. Uh, this is what's gonna make your bacon really, really special. Peppered maple bacon. The beauty of making this yourself is that you just can't buy this in the store. Pick a really lovely quality maple syrup and finish your bacon. It's a real crowd pleaser. Try stepping outside of some of the heavier grilled items with the sugary sauces and try having something a little bit lighter this summer. Halibut, a really nice, light, clean, mild fish that has a quick cooking time. This is really uh, refreshing and light on heavy, hot days. You can have it hot or you can serve it cold. When cooking anything on your grill that you think might stick, a good idea is to get the grill up to a very high temperature, clean the grill itself, and uh, lightly oil the surface of it. This will help in getting things not to stick to your grill. Now that my grill is lightly oiled, I'm gonna take my piece of halibut and place it on top. It's important that your halibut is lightly oiled as well as seasoned. Halibut lends itself nicely to dry rubs and other spices. I'm going to put my halibut on the grill and I'm going to wait. I only want to flip my halibut once. If I move it too much, it's going to flake and fall apart. So patience is the key here. But remember, it's got a very quick cooking time. My halibut's starting to get slightly opaque on the outside. It's still a little translucent in the middle. And what I want to do now is I want to flip it. Uh, I've got this uh, Fitch spatula. I really like these. They're super thin, um, extremely flexible, and that's going to allow me to kind of pick at it and get it up if it's sticking at all, as well as it's very delicate. And when the fish is cooked, it starts to flake apart. So if I can do anything to help make my fish dish successful, this would be it. Now that my halibut's grilled, I've chosen to finish it with a little bit of a cucumber salad with a light lemon vinaigrette. These should pair nicely for these hot, hot days. I want to show you how to add an additional smoky flavor to just about anything you're going to be barbecuing. 
Right now, I've got some wood chips that I've soaked in water, and I started soaking them about an hour ago. I've also got some dry wood chips. I like to do a two-thirds ratio of wet to a third ratio of dry. I'm doing the wet chips because I want to allow my grill to have some time to heat them up and get a little bit of smoke going. Gonna add my dry wood chips. Gonna roll this over, like so. And what I'm doing is I'm creating a little bit of a housing for these smoke chips to get going. Now, you can also use a smoke pack. There's little perforated boxes you can buy, but I find this works just as well. And who doesn't have tin foil around? Got my smoke pack. I'm now gonna poke a couple holes in it. I'm gonna place this on a grill with a little bit of heat. I'm gonna wait till it starts smoking. I wanna make sure that this is smoking and not on fire. This I can use on a gas grill, a barbecue grill, and it's gonna introduce a whole nother flavor profile to anything I'm barbecuing. Step outside your comfort zone with a smoke pack. Go a little bit beyond uh, the old-fashioned steak, and you can use this for seafood, poultry, you can even smoke tomatoes.